the clerk will open the court. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. The Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of Texas, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the state of Texas and this Honorable Court. Good morning. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to require adjustments of the justice system. Social distancing and group size restrictions as well as substantial hardships on council traveling to Austin make it difficult for us to hold arguments in our courtroom. Accordingly, we are proceeding through remote connections. Court staff has made every effort to prepare us and council, but of course there may be glitches that will require patience. Otherwise, we will proceed as we would in person. The arguments are being live streamed and a recording will be available later today. We're ready to hear argument in 181187, Endeavor Energy Resources against Energen Resources from Howard County and the 11th Court of Appeals District. May it please the court. Mr. Young will present argument for petitioner. Petitioner has reserved five minutes for rebuttal. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The ultimate question in this case is not whether Endeavor's interpretation of paragraph 16C of the lease is correct or Energen's interpretation is correct. The court may choose to address that issue first, but it will not be dispositive of the case. Since the parties agree that paragraph 16C is a special limitation on the granted estate and that special limitations are to be construed against termination, the ultimate question is whether Endeavor's interpretation is reasonable. And the court may choose to reach that issue first as it did in 1919 in Decker versus Curlix. Three terms in paragraph 16C must be analyzed. Accumulate, 150 day terms, and next. Each must be construed in the context of the lease as a whole and each must be harmonized with the others and with the rest of the lease. That is what Endeavor versus Discovery, XOG versus Chesapeake, Anadarko versus Thompson, and a host of other cases from this court require. We have to start somewhere, so let's start with accumulate. Here the battle lines are drawn. We say that accumulating something necessarily involves accretion either adding to what already exists, bringing together separate quantities to create a mass, or creating a base quantity from which to build. Energen, on the other hand, says that there can be a one-time accumulation of something and that it isn't necessarily accretive. We say that stretches the term too far, but the ultimate question is not whether Energen's position is correct or even whether it's reasonable. The ultimate question is whether Endeavor's position is reasonable. And it seems reasonable to apply the words Latin root and common usage to require the accumulation be part of a process of heaping up, either incipient or already in progress. Next, let's turn to 150 days. And here again- Mr. Young. Yes, Mr. Honor. Young, Justice Boyd, um, before you leave accumulate. I'm sorry, Your Honor, you're muted. I, I understand your argument on that point. M my question is this, um, let's assume you are 100 days into one of the continuous uh, development or one of the extension periods uh, and then you start development on that 101st day. Uh, you've clearly come within the requirements of the provision. Um, and because you've started your development on the 101st day, you don't need the 102nd or the 103rd or the 104th within that 150 day period. 
why aren't you accumulating or accreting each of those individual days to be used under their construction, your opponent's construction for the next allowed 150 day term? In other words, why does defining the word accumulate to mean accrete not also comport with their interpretation, which is you are accumulating days for the next term? The answer, Your Honor, is because of the way the terms accrue, the, the days accrue. On day 101, in your example, in a lump sum, 49 unused days accrue. They don't accrue one on the 102nd day and one on the 103rd day and one on the 104th day and so on. On day 101, they drop from the sky and there are 49 days. Those can be said to accumulate only if they can form a mass on which to build. If they can potentially be added to other unused days from other terms. If the days accrued one by one, then they would accumulate within the term, but they don't. Energen says 150 days means 150 days, period, exclamation point. Endeavor says it's more nuanced than that. The paragraph has six references to 150 days. We know that the continuous drilling references, number three and number four, speak of 150 day periods, but those periods may be extended. So it's logical to ask whether the accumulation and extension references, references five and six, likewise can include extended terms. And here it's important to note that the extension of a term, the rollover of days to that term, extends the term, that is to say, elongates it, enlarges it. It doesn't create a separate add-on additional supplemental term. So once a 150-day term has been extended, it is no longer a 150-day term. It's a longer term than that. And that means that under Energen's construction, an extended term cannot generate unused days because only a 150-day term can generate unused days. Can you just very concisely tell me why this language, which appears to be pretty plain and clear on its face, that, quote, in order to extend the next allowed 150 day term it doesn't it's not plural it's singular between the completion of one well and the drilling of a subsequent well why does that just not clearly mean the next term it clearly does mean the next term but that begs the question of what happens during the next term and if the days have accumulated eventually the next term becomes the current term. And during that term, if the days accumulate, then they have the potential to be rolled over to the next term. Days don't roll over from any term except to the next term. But having rolled over to the next term, they have the potential of rolling over to the next term after that because that eventually becomes the next term. Uh, we Mr. analogized- Young, how, how do you- how do you square that with uh, the language saying uh, the accumulation comes from, quote, any 150-day term singular? Does, does that suggest that you can only roll over from the immediately previous 150-day singular term? Uh, or where, where do you get uh, the, uh, what's the textual hook for going back to a term before that one? The answer, Your Honor, is that the accumulation isn't what is in the 150-day term under reference number five. It is unused days in any 150-day term. Remember the rule of last antecedent. In any 150-day term modifies unused days. And so you may accumulate what? You may accumulate unused days in any 150-day term. 
because otherwise, as we mentioned earlier, the days don't accumulate within a single term. So that's the, the textual hook that 150 days there modifies the unused days. It doesn't modify accumulate. Well, and, and Mr. Young, there's another uh, time reference in that clause, which is during the continuous development program, which would say that it would extend over the entire program, not one particular term. It says any 150 day term during the continuous development program. Well, that so, implies, I, I beg your pardon, Your Honor. So, I mean, wouldn't that indicate that it's a longer period than a single term? It, in, in other words, it doesn't say the previous term. It says any term during the continuous development program. Uh, yes, you could read it that way. Uh, any term is eligible to generate an extension and then can be rolled over to the next term, but eventually used in any term during the continuous development program. So until the continuous development program comes to an end by the failure to drill a well within the allowable period, uh, both the rolling over from and the rolling over to can continue. I want to turn in my remaining minutes to the purpose of continuous drilling and extended development clauses. This court made clear in Endeavor versus Discovery that clauses such as paragraph 16C strike a balance between two sets of purposes and two sets of interests. It is the lessor's interest to fully develop the leased acreage as quickly as possible so that royalties can begin to accrue. It is the lessee's purpose and interest to do the same thing, but to do it with the flexibility to respond to logistical constraints and to the market. And this court has said these clauses balance these purposes. We believe that endeavors construction of paragraph 16C strikes a better balance than energens by allowing each and every term to generate unused days potentially, and by allowing those days to be used not only in the next term, but to become part of the next term and potentially be used in the term after that. We uh, gave you in our oral argument exhibits, and it's in our brief as well, some diagrams illustrating that it is arbitrary to say that, for example, an extra 10 days that has been earned can be used in the immediate following term, but not in the term after that, that that does not appropriately balance the lessor's and lessee's interest. And in fact, Council, that, Council, it, it's my understanding that, that uh, if your opponent's position is correct, then the lease would have expired very early on in this arrangement, much earlier on than, than what's now being alleged. That uh, is correct, Your Honor. What, uh, outside of, of course, course of performance, which I understand your argument about course of performance, but is there, is there any other legal consequence to to, to that fact that under their reading, uh, the lease would have expired in the first couple of months or the, the no, first couple uh, of terms, excuse me. I, I beg your pardon. Energen did not press that claim uh, and it is not embodied in the judgment. The judgment uh, quiets title in endeavor to the existing drilled wells, save and accept the last one. But if Mr. Quinn had pressed that issue, then the lease would have terminated much earlier and uh, no one ever contended that contemporaneously and nor do they contend it now. I suppose they might be barred by race judicata from trying to go back and relitigate whether they, they well, actually, it was actually expired way back then. 
I think that's right. The judgment quiets title to an endeavor to those wells that were drilled after that date, uh, save and accept the last well. So I think, uh, I think they're bound by that judgment. The ultimate question in this case is whether Endeavor's position is a reasonable position. Uh, this court has said many times that forfeitures are not to be applied unless uh, a limitation is clear. We know that this is that there's a distinction between a special limitation and a forfeiture, but the rule is the same. And this court very clearly said that in both Endeavor versus Discovery and XOG versus Chesapeake and other cases. We think the Court of Appeals got it wrong, both in its construction of the plain language of the lease and in its application of the special limitation rule and that under either of those we prevail. And so it is our prayer that the court reverse the judgment of the Court of Appeals, render judgment in Endeavor's favor on the title issues and remand Endeavor's counterclaim to the trial court for resolution. Unless the court has any questions, that concludes my opening argument. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Young. We'll hear from the respondent. Good morning, and may it please the court. Each case turns on the text of the provision at issue in the oil and gas lease. Perhaps this is most uh, clearly stated in the XOG uh, versus Chesapeake case and the Energen versus Endeavor case. In those cases, of course, like in many, many oil and gas cases before this court, the court takes a provision of a lease and settles its meaning as a matter of law. The court has a duty to harmonize and give effect to the plain language of the party's contract and enforce it as written. Mr. Davis, um, counsel, um... Mr. Jung uh, talked about the balancing of the interest. And when we're examining whether a in particular interpretation is reasonable, what role or how should we look at this uh, balancing of the interest at stake, um, particularly given you know, this industry's importance to Texas? Well, Your Honor, I think the continuous development clause is the party's attempt to balance the interest. So what they agreed to, uh, obviously, uh, the less the less oil wants more drilling and faster, and the less he sometimes wants to slow it down. So what was the negotiation, and where did they land in the in the text of, of the document? So my answer to you is the text of the document is what balanced the deal. There's broad freedom of contract, and the parties. Uh, could Mr. Have. Davis, may I ask you, so your your position, as I understand it, hinges on it being clear that your reading of the document is plain and unequivocal. Yeah, what absolutely. is, and so what is your, because that's how we get to the, and that's what's reasonable because it's plain and unambiguous. Right. But his argument is that the unused days in the first 150 day term when they roll over to the next term, say 30 days left, and, and so you have the 150 plus the 30 in the next 150-day term, so you have 180. And his argument is that now those become unused days in the second term, and that's how it keeps going, and that's how this language next term actually supports his argument because those days become the next term, which if that's correct, then that means that this language is not clear, that there are two possible mm -hmm. meetings. So what is your response to that argument that those days become the part of the next term? I need to look at the text and I plan to, but you have to understand in all gas leases, some leases have no banking clause at all in the continuous development. And some oil and gas leases 
have cumulative banking clause, whereby you can use every unused day from all prior periods. And this is real simple to write that kind of cumulative banking clause into an oil and gas lease, but this one doesn't. And here's what the trade was. Here was the negotiation. You had 11,300 acres in one lease. You had a lessor with a lot of bargaining power. You had a lessor with a lot of incentive to protect the land. And here's, here's what the trade ended up. One wanted banking, one didn't want banking. And they compromised and said, look, if we drill a well early, at least cut us some slack on the next well. That was the trade. That's what this language means, because when we look at it, it says lessee shall have the right to accumulate unused days in any 150 day term. Well, on the so completion- I'd, I'd like to make sure I understand you, your position on how all the math works, uh, because I think okay. there've been two different representations of, of what your position might be. So the, the first term's 150 days, I only use 100. I think we all agree that the next term is 200 days. What if the term after, after, what if in that 200 day term, I only use 100 days? Well, do I, do, do I roll, a, their position is that you roll over the 100 extra. Is your position that, that you, you get, you roll over nothing because it wasn't a 150 day term, it was a 200 day term? Or is your position that you roll over the difference between the 100 that I used and the, and the 150 day term? Accumulation they've used here has got to have a temporal context. And from the front to the end of this continuous development clause, after you complete a well, you've always got a new 150 day term. It starts from completion. So from the prior well, you get the completion date that starts the clock on the next well. And you also, from the prior well, find out how many unused days there are. So if you had 30 unused days on the first well, you add it, it says it extends the next 150 day term. It doesn't make the next term 180 day term. It extends seven times in this provision. The parties wrote out 150 days, 150 days. And the reason you do that is to prevent ambiguity. So, so, so if I could go back to the to the to the math, just to, I really want to understand okay. your position. Uh, if I let's say I just keep using a hundred days, okay, do I keep getting fifty extra each each term? If I use a hundred days every time, is, is the next term always two hundred days? Do do I bank those those fifty days at every single time? I only use a hundred. I think I understand your question, and the answer is yes. You don't roll over from the next to the next to the next to the next. This says 150-day term, unused day, get, extends the next term. So you can earn in any 150-day term, the unused days, those are the ones that extend the next term. And that was the trade. If you drill a well early, cut me some slack on the next well. And it's easy to count. It's exactly what these parties agreed to. Um, and, I Mr. Mean, Davis? Yes. Um, it, you had said that it, the clause needs a temporal element. Yes. And there is a, there is an, a temporal element uh, that's in connection with the accumulation clause. And it says any 150 day term during the continuous development program. Right. Doesn't, Instead of the current term or the previous term, it says any term during the entire program, not a particular term. I think I understand. Uh, so how do you harmonize during the program with uh, your focus on the current term I think as, I as being the, the place where you accumulate? I, I, I think that's a good question. The way I harmonize it, and I think the way that the sentence is written, you can have multiple 150-day terms during the continuous development program. 
to me, all this is saying is that in any one of those terms, you can earn unused days. So there might be 15 continuous development terms in, during the drilling of this thing. And in, in any one of those during the continuous development, you can earn unused days. But the problem is you can only use them on the next well, the way this is written. So, so do the unused days, are they used or do they lapse according they to their construction? They, they lapse. lapse. So now, is there anything, anything in the clause about unused days, plural, that have been accumulated lapsing? No, but what there is, it says, has the right to accumulate unused days in any 150 day term to extend the next term during the continuous development. It would have been so easily if they were trying to write a cumulative banking clause. Lessee shall have the right to accumulate unused days in any prior term during the continuous development period in order to extend the next term for the drilling of well or well or wells. That, that's so simple to write. They but wrote you, this. Under your construction, you would say then it would only extend to the next term. That's what you just read is similar in that uh, it says in the next term. So I'm not sure that that construction differs significantly. Well, the, I think the court of How appeals, does it? I think the court of appeals construction is the correct one. It, it says you earn in a 150 day term and you can use the, those days in the next term. And, and, and that just, you've got two wells and you just keep marching in that fashion. And, and uh, I believe that's what this says. What, what here, here's really what uh, the petitioners do. The petitioner wants this case not to be decided as a matter of law. The petitioner does not want the court to settle the meaning of this clause because if it is of doubtful meaning, if it's ambiguous, then the tie goes to the lessee. That's the end game. But what they do to get there is they give the word accumulate an unreasonably restrictive definition they then force that definition, deposition, excuse me, definition back into the clause and out of context. They argue 150 days really doesn't mean 150 days. They argue next doesn't really mean next. They ignore some of the terms. They argue averages that are not in the text. They argue a balancing of interest that aren't in the text. And this is a classic example of trying to rewrite the contract. That's exactly. Mr. Davis, uh, the petitioner argues that if its construction is reasonable, it wins whether yours is reasonable or not. Do you agree? Right. Do you agree with that? I think going all the way back to the Knight versus Chicago Corporation, when you're dealing with a limitation on an estate, if the court is unable to give the clause a certain and definite legal meaning under its plain language, then the court has got to hold that the lease didn't lapse. And that's the end game for the petitioner here. And, but, uh, Your Honor, I mean, we have to go back a long time in this court's jurisprudence since this court held something to be ambiguous. I mean, the court, because there are conflicting interpretations, doesn't mean that the court can't settle the legal meaning of the, of the party's agreement. And uh, I well, think- this, this ambiguity is, is, is unambiguous and, and clear, precise, and unequivocal the same thing. I mean, are, the, are those the same standards or is this a, a more rigorous standard than, than uh, determining ambiguity? I, I think uh, Justice Boyd wrote about that in the unanimous opinion in the Endeavor versus Discovery operating. It, 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 it's, and you look back to the Knight versus Chicago Corporation. I don't think it's a, the standard is necessarily ambiguous, 
but if it's of doubtful meaning where you can't settle it as the meaning as a matter of law. And so I don't know the difference. But when you apply the, the tie goes to the runner rule, you do that in a situation where the court cannot settle the meaning of the, of, of the provision of the issue. So uh, I, is it amb ambiguity? No, the, the Endeavor versus Discovery offering doesn't say ambiguity. It's just clear, precise, and unequivocal uh, language. So uh, it's close to ambiguity, but the court doesn't say ambiguity. Let me mention something about in this argument aid about this 150-day continuous development clause. I don't know if you've ever seen a 150-day continuous development clause. I haven't. They're 120 and 180. That's what we see over and over and over in oil gas leases. And the party split the difference and got to 150. Let's look at the banking clause. There's no banking and there's unlimited cumulative banking. And what happened? The parties split the difference. And this is an unusual on gas lease. It's typewritten from front to back. It's not a pre-printed form with an opinion. Mr. Davis, where, where would we look to see an ex uh, sort of a prototypical example of a continuous banking clause? Uh, there's one in the uh, West forms and I, and I think we put two in, in there. Well, there's one in the summary judgment record. We just pulled a lease out of the uh, D records and included it in our summary judgment exhibits. And then West Farms has several. And, and the thing you find about them, they don't say well singular, they say wells plural. They don't say term singular, they say terms plural. That, I mean, this whole paragraph is singular. All the continuous banking clauses use the plural as, uh, as one of the courts pointed out. So every word is typewritten. There's 11,300 acres in one lease. Conventional wisdom would say, break it up. But that gives the lessor a lot of bargaining power. And you just have to read this lease a little bit to know that these people were professional. They knew what they were doing. Creeping this concept in that maybe these folks didn't know what they were doing uh, doesn't work. And look at the word completion. The court in this contention, the court may not even have recognized this yet, but the clock starts on completion. In most oil and gas cases, the completion may not occur for a year after the weld is drilled. But, but this lessor was smarter than that. Look at what he says. In order to extend the 150 day term, a well shall be deemed to be completed 10 days after the drilling rig moves. And the questions earlier about, oh, didn't it terminate barely into the lease and shouldn't you have done something about that? The summary judgment evidence that Endeavor put in was from rig release. It was not from the day that the rig moved off the hull. They released the rig, but it takes a few days to get it off the hull. And uh, Energen had this at least two days before it filed suit. He bought the lease, and because of the negotiations with other folks, they filed suit. I mean, there are no secrets in the oil field. We knew who else was trying to buy the lease, et cetera. So seven times, 150 days. Completion, 10 days after uh, the rig's released. I mean, the off the hull, you've got a 150 day term. You, you have a deemed completion, you've got a 150 day term. These 150 days operate in sequence. And when you get down to the banking clause, it does too. All singular, one well, next well. Um, it's easy to write a cumulative banking clause and the court can harmonize the
this language. The court has harmonized language. I mean, I was in both discovery operating and XOG. Those were both my cases, companion. And I think those were harder to harmonize than this one is. This looks pretty simple to me. Next means next, 150 days means 150 days. And you don't have to redefine, accumulate, force it into the document and violate the rules of contract construction. The unused days are earned and then they can be used in the next well. They can earn unused days in that period and they can use them in the next well. That was the oil deal. That's the way oil people trade. Um, drill it early and we'll cut you some slack on the next well. That's what they agreed to. Um, Endeavor's argument really is that the text doesn't mean what it says. And Energen's argument is the text means exactly what it says and it makes sense. Uh, the goal from Energen's Endeavor's perspective is to make this thing confusing so the court can't give meaning to this oil and gas lease clause written by pros, typewritten from front to back. And I just think the court uh, can apply the rules and give the text its plain meaning and settle uh, this matter. Thank you. Any well, other questions? Please. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Young, I believe you have five minutes. May it please the court. I have three or four very brief points to make and I'll be happy to respond to questions. Mr. Davis argues in essence that this lease could have been clearer and we agree, but that's not the legal standard for anything. Virtually every contract this court considers could have been clearer or the parties wouldn't be in this court. He describes uh, some negotiations, but those are hypothetical conjectural negotiations. There is no evidence in this record of the actual negotiations. And so he is putting thoughts and words into the party's mouths when he does that. At one point in Mr. Davis's argument, he said that unused days extend a 150 day term, but they don't make it longer. Well, the dictionary definition of to extend is to make bigger or larger. Uh, if I have a certain waistline going into the pandemic and I don't watch my diet carefully and I extend my waistline, my waistline is not what it was, it's what it is. And so when a 150 day term is extended by 30 unused days, it is not still a 150 day term. It is a 180 day term. And so then the court must consider whether it is capable of generating any unused days at all. Uh, and Mr. Davis, literal 150 days means 150 days position would argue no to that. But, but, he, but he says, that's not the position he takes, right? He says that he, even though it's a 180 day term, you, you look at day 150 and count backwards from that to determine how many days roll over to the, to the next one. That, that's, that, that's what I take him to be saying. That's his bottom line today. It was not his bottom line in the response to the petition for review where he said extended terms are incapable of generating unused days. But the way he gets to where he is today in this court, he can't say a 180 day term generates extensions because that's inconsistent with his extreme literalism position. So what he has to say is a 180 day term isn't really a 180 day term. It's just a very fat 150 day term. That, that defies logic, it defies the the rules of, uh, of verbal usage, and it simply can't be the case. 
Well, Mr. Young, the contract does say 150 day term and the next 150 day term. So why shouldn't we treat it as a 150 day term and then look at the uh, accumulated days as uh, an extension that only carries over to the next term? Uh, two reasons, Your Honor. Uh, first of all, because the immediate two preceding references to 150 days necessarily mean more than 150 days in the case of an extension. If references three and four don't include extensions, then there cannot be extensions. Extensions cannot have any effect. And we know the rule that the terms in the same clause of a contract are to be given the same meaning, if at all possible. And the second reason is, if you apply 150 days literally disregarding extensions in reference five, then you create, uh, contrary to what Mr. Davis seems to be saying, but you create this alternating pattern of extendable and non-extendable terms that has no discernible purpose. Mr. Davis said, this clause means drill it early and we'll cut you some slack on the next well. And we agree with that. Once you understand that the next well eventually becomes the current well and cutting, drilling it early means drilling it before it is due with extensions. And in that case, we cut you some slack on the next well after that. Uh, next becomes current, current is extendable to next. Uh, so for those reasons, uh, we pray as we prayed in our brief, uh, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any final questions. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, the case is submitted and the court will take a brief recess.